Hello, internet user. Welcome back to Unused Content, the amazingly named show that you all thought was dead. Well, wait no further, dear audience. I'm finally back to tell you all about the magical unused secrets of the second generation of Pokemon. Because hey, the first one got views, so I think it's time to get some more. Future Christian, throw some boobs in the thumbnail there for good measure. Oh yeah, on my way to YouTube stardom already. Much like the last generation, Gold, Silver, and Crystal version have a large amount of content that goes completely unseen in the final game. This time around, I'd say that there's even more to see than in Red, Blue, and Yellow. No, I'm not talking about things like the Pokecom Center and the Celebi event that were excluded from the international releases. I'm talking about buried relics within the game's data that never saw the light of day anywhere in the world. To start off, let me tell you about a cool fact that was actually the original inspiration for this entire series. Take a look at this map of Violet City. Notice anything strange? For some odd reason, there is a house with two signs in the bottom left corner of the map, with no way of reaching it. Now I've played these games a million times by now, and not once during then was I ever aware of such a thing's existence. At best, you can only get a glimpse of this rock here by walking along the edge of the trees. It seems incredibly mysterious to just place a house here. In the game's data, we can even see an early version of Violet City's map, which doesn't feature the house in that location, but has the same rock with a cave entrance there instead. As for this building's intended purpose, it's hard to say. We can match some of the buildings between the two maps to rule out a few possibilities, however. Striking out the obvious Pokemon Center, Pokemart, Gym, and Sprout Tower, we're only left with the generic buildings that could really be anything. But hey, why don't we find out ourselves firsthand? With the power of cheating, we can make it so that we can walk through walls and reach the house ourselves. Unfortunately, upon closer inspection, there isn't much else we can really do here. Both of these signs don't have any text when examined, and attempting to walk into the door will force your character to move back out. There also doesn't appear to be any kind of interior map associated with this house, so even if the door did work, it would probably just crash the game anyway. We can see that there are lights on, though, so who knows, maybe there's someone living there, all alone, forever trapped, in isolation. Break out those 7th grade writing skills, kids, there's creepypasta theories to be written. But enough about that old dingy house, we've barely even scratched the surface of the Gen 2 games. Next, let's talk about a few small but still cool features that ended up being left out. Apparently at one point, the attack Payday was going to be a field move. For those of you that don't know, Payday is a move that increases the amount of money you earn at the end of a battle whenever you use it. By hacking it into the game, you can make the unused option appear on the menu, but it's not functional and only causes the game to crash. Unfortunately though, when I was recording footage for this video, I couldn't get the options to appear in the game, but somehow while attempting to do it, I managed to turn this girl here red. Yeah. It's unknown exactly how this would have worked outside of battle, as field moves can be used infinitely, but with a move designed around increasing your money, you can see the obvious potential to exploit it. This is likely the reason it was scrapped. As for this other option you see here that says Error, it was also apparently supposed to be a field move at some point. However, it too doesn't have any function when hacked into the game, and whatever it originally was intended for remains a mystery. Speaking of unknown purposes, it was apparently planned at one point for the player to be able to name their own mother. Given the incredibly minor roles that mothers play in the Pokemon games, it certainly seems like an odd choice to be able to name her here. Really though, even in this generation, the most notable thing your mother will do is occasionally call you to inform you that she blew the money you asked her to hold for you on useless items. Damn it, Mom! That was my money! I massacred a small child's pets to earn it fair and square! The process of naming your mother is completely functional, but it's impossible to access without hacking, as it would otherwise never normally appear. There is also an unused color test menu in Memory Match Game for the Goldenrod Game Corner. Using an elaborate setup, it's actually possible to access these via glitches. Now let's talk about a cool little leftover from early in development. Out of all the unused maps in the game, only one of them contains a person that you can speak to. This house here. This lady here tells us, When my Pokemon got sick, the pharmacist in Ecrotique made some medicine for me. What's interesting about this is that in the final game, the pharmacy that this lady is referring to was located at Cianwood City, not Ecrotique City. I find it strange that instead of just altering her text after changing the placement of the pharmacy, they straight up just banished this poor woman to the abyss where she could never be found. Also, I think there is something wrong with her ride on here. But there's actually a little more to this house than you may think. It seems that when they were making the map for Olivine City, this house was supposed to be there. However, when it was scrapped, they didn't actually remove the warp tile for her door. No, instead, they moved it to the very top left of the map. By using a cheat to walk through walls, we can reach said tile. 
However, the warp tile doesn't function properly in its current state, so simply walking on it will cause nothing to happen. But with the use of another cheat, we can change the properties of the tile into that of a hole, meaning that when we now step on it, we'll fall right into it and into the woman's house. Why, hello there, ma'am. Just thought I'd drop by to say hello. Late into the game, in Viridian City, the player has access to the Trainer House. This place is where you can do battle against the team of the last person you did Mystery Gift with. If you are a lonely child like me, then you're probably aware that if you've never used Mystery Gift even once, then you'll fight a trainer named Cal, whose team is made up of all three final evolutions of the Johto starters at level 50. However, although never seen in-game, Cal actually has two other teams of Pokémon assigned to him both of which contain the different stages of evolution for the Johto starters at lower levels. This would seem to imply that the player was originally going to have access to the trainer house much earlier in the game, and that Cal's team would gradually grow stronger as the player progressed on their journey. And while we're in Kanto, I've got something neat to mention regarding Cinnabar Island. Any veteran Pokémon player is well aware that in the Generation 2 games, nearly all of Cinnabar Island is destroyed by a volcanic eruption by the time you reach it in this game. As for what volcano erupted, you tell me. The only thing that's left on the island in Gen 2 is just a lone Pokemon Center, but the game seems to have data for the entire Pokemon lab that appeared in the first generation. The purpose the lab would have played in the Generation 2 games isn't clear, but it seems that the island may not have always been planned to have been destroyed. One concept that was more explored in Generation 2 was the ability for wild Pokémon to flee from battle. The most well-known example of this being the game's legendary trio, Reku, Entei, and Suicune, who would roam around the entire region and run away the instant you managed to find them. Interestingly enough, these three were not the only legendary Pokémon of Gen 2 to be given the ability to flee from battle. Going into the game's data, it can be seen that the Pokémon Articuno, Zapdos, and Moltres have 50-50 chances of fleeing on every turn that passes during a wild encounter. This seems pretty strange, as these three Pokémon cannot be found anywhere in the Generation 2 games, and are one of the few Pokémon that can only be acquired by transferring them from the Generation 1 games. The only possible explanation for this is that at some point the developers intended for these three to act as roaming Pokémon alongside the Legendary Beasts. This could even be an early concept of how the trio would later appear in Pokémon X and Y, where based on which starter the player chose, one of them would appear roaming around the map, requiring you to encounter them a dozen times before finally getting a chance to capture them. It's also worth noting that there are a few other Pokémon in Gen 2 programmed with the chance to flee. These are all also impossible to encounter in the wild, and unlike the legendary birds, actually have a much smaller chance to flee. These Pokémon are Eevee, Umbreon, Porygon, and Togetic. In the final game, the only way to obtain an Eevee is to receive it from the character Bill in Goldenrod City. And the only way to obtain its evolutions, including Umbreon, would be to either evolve said Eevee or breed another to do so. The situation is similar for Togetic, as its entire evolution line also cannot be caught in the wild, and its pre-evolution is acquired by hatching the egg the player receives early in the game. Lastly, Porygon, like in the previous games, can only be gotten as a prize at the Celadon Game Corner by exchanging enough coins. It's not known exactly why this mechanic is in place for these four Pokémon, but I think I have a pretty reasonable theory. In the first generation games, the only place that Pokémon were able to flee was in the Safari Zone. The Generation 2 games were originally planned to feature this area as well, but it was never completed and did not appear in the final games. It's possible that these four were intended to appear within Generation 2's Safari Zone, and the developers only got as far as giving the fleeing mechanic to as few as four Pokémon before the plug was pulled on the idea. Speaking of which, there are actually two unused maps related to the Safari Zone. The first is a gate that doesn't have any NPCs present. This is clearly supposed to be the area where you pay to enter, just like in Gen 1. The next map is the actual Safari Zone itself, but there really isn't too much to see here. There are no Pokémon to be found in the grass or by surfing, and there's no exits leading to different areas. Like in the previous games, the music that plays here is the evolution theme. I should mention though that it's still possible to encounter a few Pokémon by fishing. The only real notable thing on this map to me is the appearance of these water fountains, which cannot be found anywhere else in the game. Even if my hypothesis about the previously mentioned Pokémon is incorrect, it's still incredibly obvious that the development of the Safari Zone was ended very early on. The exact reason for this isn't known, but it's possible that it had something to do with limited cartridge space of the Game Boy. Considering that Game Freak fit two entire regions into the games, it wouldn't be out of the question to say that a large-scale area such as the Safari Zone would need to be cut out as a compromise. 
That's all for today, but thank you for watching, and stick around for part two, which will be coming up very soon. Hey everybody, thank you all so much for watching this video. Um, I know it's been a long time since I uploaded here, but honestly, since I uploaded my first round of videos, I just sort of was demotivated, you know, they weren't getting many views, but you know, I, I come back and I see like the first the first unused content video had like has like almost four thousand views at the time of recording this, so I figured, you know, you know, why the hell not? Um, if you'd like to see more videos, you know, you can hit like and subscribe. That that really motivates me, like you have no idea. And I am also still pretty active on my gameplay channel, so if you if you while you're waiting for part two, you know, you can go watch me be an idiot and play some games here. Um I recommend, uh, you know, you can go watch Pocket Mirror. You know, that's a fun little game I'm playing right now. I'm working, also working on a review video for for this channel of it, so you know, you should you should watch it. It's fun. You can also check out like, what, what's another game I played? Like Moirai? Yeah, right, sh sure, we'll put that there too. And you know, put a little put a little thumbnail for like uh, the first unused content, Future Christian. Yeah, all right, all right. Anyways, thank you all so much for watching. And so, I can't talk today. I can't talk at all. Goodbye. Thanks for watching. See y'all later.